Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about an overview of the wireless design process. When you design a wireless network, it's very important to plan and prepare properly. You can just dive in and start throwing access points up on the ceiling, buy in different types of access points, but it's much better if you plan appropriately and lay out the designs, plan the designs, gather the information and do everything at the start before you even consider position and placement of the access points. If you do this, if you use a structured design, it helps you successfully deploy and it helps you optimize what you want to do. We're going to be using the Cisco lifecycle services approach. It's going to increase the value of the network. How? It's going to save you time. It's going to optimize your network. In essence, saving money. It's going to increase your network staff productivity and it's going to improve the network availability the resiliency, the security, and the scalability. A long time ago in college, I learned a very important lesson about planning and preparation. They taught us a method they taught us a methodology to design programming code. I would always sit down and start typing away. Uh, one day I thought, you know what, I need to give this a try. Yes, it spent a lot more time in the early planning stages, but I got to successfully work in code much, much quicker. So I learned the lesson the hard way that proper planning using a design methodology gets you to a, an end result much quicker. Uh, hopefully you trust me on this and take our word for it and use this design philosophy to actually design wireless networks and get to a working successful Wi-Fi much quicker. We're going to be using the PPDIOO prepare plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize life cycle model. This is one developed by Cisco a long time ago, and it can be used on wireless networks, wired networks, wide area networks. It can be used on any of the networking topologies you need to build. We're going to be focused on this methodology in the wireless network world. So we're going to be using this as a template to go and talk about the different stages of the PPDIOO with wireless design. Before we start doing that, though, we need to think about the different types of wireless installations we can do. It may be a new design, or it may be an upgraded design. If it's a new design, you have a blank piece of paper, and you can start from scratch and do what you need to do. If it's an upgrade design, that means you're upgrading what already exists. So you need to find out what the situation is with the current working network. What problems do they have with the current network? You'll probably have the same problems with the new network. You may be asked to do a design and a parallel design as the building is being built, as the building is being upgraded. So you may have to do Wi-Fi design along with campus routing and switching. So you don't want to go and do the campus routing and switching, do the Wi-Fi design, and then say, hey, we need some new faster switches. That needs to be decided at the start. So what impact on the campus routing and switching will the Wi-Fi have? What impact will you have on the WAN? You may think none. What if you have a remote office with APs but no local wireless LAN controller? How's that going to influence the WAN? Where are you going to put the wireless LAN controllers in the switch architecture? Are you going to put the wireless LAN controllers in the data center? Or are you going to have the wireless LAN controllers in the MDFs or the IDFs? It's a very important question to answer. Then you have to consider security, not just the wireless security you're going to be using, but the physical security of the devices as well. If it's an upgrade design, you need to pay attention to what's going on in the wireless network at the moment. So usually in an upgrade design, we are upgrading or replacing the current wireless infrastructure for something new. Usually you're going to swap out the access points. If you swap out the access points, is that going to change the coverage model you have for the access points? Do the new access points have different power level support than the old access points? Are you upgrading from another vendor to Cisco? 
AP is. It's quite common for customers to use their Wi-Fi deployment for about many years. So you may not be going in and upgrading AC Wave 1 to AC Wave 2. You may be upgrading B and G to N to AC Wave 1 to AC Wave 2. Sometimes you don't need the latest and greatest. You may just be upgrading to AC Wave 1, for example. You don't need the performance of the latest and greatest access points. I came across this recently with a warehouse design we were doing. We needed coverage, and we needed basic coverage. We didn't need advanced features. So we went for a, a lower model of Cisco and an older model of Cisco. I say older. Uh, it's, it's still quite new, but it's not the most recent model of Cisco that they needed. Sometime in the future, they may upgrade, and they may decide they need new fe features. And then, of course, we'll upgrade there and then. The initial phase of an upgrade should be focused on determining the perceived constraints. One of the most important questions you have to ask the customer is, what is the budget? What type of applications are you going to be using? What type of clients are you going to be using? It's a huge mistake to start designing a full-on Wi-Fi network when you find that the customer has a budget that, ex that does not exceed their expectations. Or put another way, that expectations exceed their budget. That happens very, very often. Hey, I want a network that does everything, but I've only got this small budget to play with. So sometimes you have to educate the customer and say, do you really want one gigabit throughput per user when they're all sharing a three megabit pipe to the internet? Questions like that need to be established at the start to find out and set the true expectations of the customer for their network. You may have specific questions to do with RF coverage, bandwidth, what type of area coverage, and roaming expectations. There are no roaming, or there's lots of roaming. That's two different design adjustments you have to make. So <clears throat> ABGN networks have limitations that can cause customer issues. Wi-Fi networks, whether they're ABGN or even AC or even AX, they can be prone to interference, especially so in the 2.4 gigahertz range. You may find it's a crowded spectrum. I was recently at the Cisco office in Manhattan, and I could see 56 other access points from the floor we were on, on 2.4 gigahertz, where there's only three usable channels. In that solution, 5 gigahertz was, of course, the best way to go. So you may find that Wi-Fi is becoming crowded in your particular frequency. Oh, we don't allow Uni2. We don't allow Uni2 extended. We're in Europe. We don't have Uni3. You now have four channels to work with in Uni1. So you may think, oh, it's going to be easy to install 5 gigahertz, but the customer requirements may make you operate in Uni1 because you're in Sweden, for example, and Uni2 and Uni2 extended have satellite interference in the area you're in. So it's very important you understand the limitations and the constraints of the customer and your area. You may have limited bandwidth availability and you want to do video. If you design the Wi-Fi network wrong, you're going to have poor video performance. Again, channel selection and channel overlap and signal strength can be an issue. Hey, let's use 80 megahertz channels. Well, we're in Europe. We don't want to use Uni2e. We have eight channels, Uni1 and Uni2. If you start doing 80 megahertz channel bonding, You've just used up both those frequency ranges, and you've only got two channels left. So selection of the Wi-Fi parameters and talking to your customers and understanding the customer requirements and what's available in the area you're operating in is very, very important. You may find you have older devices that can limit the functionality. I always say, hey, let's get rid of 802.11b now. Let's move on from 802.11b. But if you have a large supermarket chain that has thousands of B barcode scanners that operate correctly, they are not going to be open to upgrade from B because you don't like it. Okay? So you need to work with the customer and find out what they need because from their perspective, the B scanners are just fine in the warehouse. So you need, may need to, move, to work around things like that. Poor design and poor implementation of antenna selection, antenna orientation and placement is quite a common reason that a Wi-Fi network could fail. Selecting channels, SSID, 
signal and power settings incorrectly is another reason why Wi-Fi can fail. What about the client device settings? You want to go out maybe and you want to install brand new AX access points for 802.11 R, K, and V. Well, what if the clients don't support that? Suddenly you've built a network for the customer that is more than they need. It's exceeded the budget and doesn't give them any enhancement or improvement. It's a very fine balance designing a wireless network. You need to know what the clients support. You need to know what the applications support. You need to know what, what it is the client wants to do. One important question you can ask the client as well is, is it going to change in the future? Many times people have designed a wireless network that works perfectly now, but stops working six months later when Christmas comes along and the client hires an extra 60 people to operate in the company for the Christmas rush on sales, for example. So you need to identify the primary customer stakeholders. Any consultant or salesperson who's been working in the industry for a while will tell you the story of the time that they sold a perfect network to a customer only to turn up with the paperwork and the customer says, well, I'm actually not the person who signs off on this. I've got to take you to such and such person. And you find out that you've been selling to the wrong person for the last two months or longer. Okay? So who is the primary customer? The person who you talk to about designing the Wi-Fi network may not have budget or sign-off authority. You may have to go to the CEO. She may or may not know much about wireless. So you go into the CEO's office and say, please sign off on this. Well, what am I buying? What are the advantages? What's it going to make my life better? How is it going to change our network? How is it going to help us perform our business? So you've been selling to the wrong person for two months, and you've got to start all over again. So very quickly determine who is the final authority on the network design, technically and for budget constraints. Identify the stakeholders. The stakeholders are anybody that has an interest. Uh, an example I can give you on this is the warehouse. You may find that the sales VP has an interest in how the warehouse performs. Salespeople may want to go down the warehouse on their uh, mobile phones and stay connected to a customer via a, a Bluetooth headset, maybe, and go and check if an actual particular product, a very expensive item, if it's actually in the warehouse. So the salespeople may go down. Yes, it's there. The customer buys it. The VP is very interested, and the VP of sales is very interested in that because that is a sales function. And you may not consider that the sales team have any interest in how you design the Wi-Fi in the warehouse. It's very important to find this out at the start of the design. This is a very important point on the bottom here. You may have to help the customers properly understand, qualify, quantify, and define their answers. What do you want, Mr. Customer? I want one gigabit per client. What's the main application? We do a front-end GUI presentation of a back-end server in our New York office. And what's your internet pipe? 10 megabits. So why are we giving every single user one gig of throughput when the main application they use is a shared 10 megabit pipe? Questions like this are very important to explain to the customer. So the customer may have expectations due to a misunderstanding of the functionality of Wi-Fi. So one important question to ask the customer is, why do you want Wi-Fi? What is it that you think the new Wi-Fi network is going to give you? Try and identify existing problem areas, existing Wi-Fi skill sets in the company. Is there a misunderstanding of what Wi-Fi can do? Is there a misunderstanding of the protocols and the standards and the amendments? Are there any future requirements in the immediate future and the long-term future that you need to change? A simple question you can ask here is, what are the future requirements? Well, we need to have more bandwidth per user within the next two years. You may decide, well, OK, let's install the latest Wi-Fi communications now, but let's spend a little bit more money and buy state-of-the-art switches from Cisco that we know will take us into the future with multi-gigabit, for example. So yes, we know we're going to have a refresh in two years, but maybe the switch refresh can be done now. Again, talking to the customer and explaining to the customer is very important here. Who are the stakeholders and the decision makers? 
think outside the box on this. Who else has a, a requirement for the Wi-Fi? What about any stakeholders or decision makers that are resisting the project? Who's against the project? Talk to them as well and find out what they don't like and what their fears are. Uh, uh, there's an old saying we used to have in England, which was FUD. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What do you think is going to happen? Well, the Wi-Fi works really well now. I'm afraid if we change it, it's not going to work. So if we can get rid of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, first of all, we help our customers, stakeholders, that want the new system, and then we help those people who are afraid to overcome their fears, and we, it's a win-win for everybody. Very often, the customer needs guidance in what they need from Wi-Fi. They may have gone to a presentation, they may have seen a presentation on the internet, or they may have read some documentation, and they think they need, they may think they need a particular type of network. Quite often, no, 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 we don't need that super duper access point. We need this older access point. When you suddenly find out that they have a lot of, a lot of roaming customers, and that the newer access point has features which will enhance and improve performance. Edutuda Alem AX, for example, is promising four times the throughput of Edutuda Alem AC. So that may help a particular customer with a lot of small communications going on on the network. So guiding the customer, training the customer can be very important. It's always going to be a company-wide project. You need to take account of the network team, the design team. These guys and gals over here are very often forgotten about until later on in the project. Involve them from the start. There may be requirements. For example, if, you, if you're in a retail industry, there may be PCI requirements in the United States. If you're in the health industry, there may be HIPAA requirements. So a good project manager can be invaluable here to keep all the teams and all the communications in line. So you want to determine the project team, who's going to head the project, who's got an involvement. You can then choose how people fit into the team, and you can interchange them accordingly. So use an organizational chart of the people in the company that are involved and any external stakeholders that may be involved for whatever reasons. Clearly identify the stakeholders. Very, very quickly, you learn that the security team need to be involved in almost everything, just like the network team need to be involved in everything. Uh, an illustration I have here is a recently company I heard of bought some cellular phones for the entire company, several hundred phones. <clears throat> they then found out they wanted to use those phones to use an application on Wi-Fi, and they found out that those phones weren't compatible with the advanced features that the access points were using. The phone team didn't think they needed to involve the networking team in the decision to buy a particular type of phone. But very, very quickly, the IT department and the security department can become invaluable resources, especially when you're doing a new project. Obviously, you're going to go and choose the project sponsors, and you're going to identify the decision makers. Decisions on when to go ahead, how to go ahead, and how much money to spend are very important. But you also may need to involve depart department managers. So if you're designing wireless in the warehouse, the, wa the warehouse manager needs to be involved. You may find worker representatives also need to be involved. You may also find user representatives need to be involved. So it may be unions or just user representatives. One trick I learned a long time ago is if I'm designing a wireless network for secretarial staff, have a secretarial member of staff sit on the project. It can, it can be used as a reward by some companies for the more senior members of staff, and they can be invaluable. What about this particular application? And the IT team and the manager look, do we use that? That's happened to me multiple times where the actual user representative has reminded the IT department about this frequently used application that maybe it's only used every holiday season or something. Oh, yeah, we forgot about that. That can seriously impact the Wi-Fi design. And thank you for watching.